1962, Joe Walker took the number one plane to an altitude of just under 250,000 feet. The number three plane, with its self-adaptive flight control system, was capable of going higher still, right to outer space. On the 17th of July, 1962, the B-52 took off with Major Bob White in the cockpit of the X-15 number three. In June, he had equaled Joe Walker's altitude record. Today, he was making man's first attempt to fly into space and back. Propelled in a ballistic trajectory by the great thrust of the XLR-99, the flight peaked at a point 59.6 miles above the Earth. The X-15 was in outer space. Bob White could see all the way from San Francisco to Mexico. He could see the curvature of the Earth. He had become the X-15's first astronaut. The next day at a White House ceremony, Bob White, Joe Walker, and Scott Crossfield were presented with American Aviation's most prestigious award, the Collier Trophy. It was presented by President John F. Kennedy. In November 1962, Air Force test pilot Jack McKay was making a low-altitude, low-speed flight to study stability and control without the X-15-2's ventral fin. Soon after drop, it became clear that something was wrong with the engine. Push your throttle up and give us chamber pressure. Uh, we don't have to name first, about 200. Roger, you got the full throttle? Okay. You're running at 30%. The XLR-99 was producing only 30% of its power. There was no alternative but to abort the flight and attempt an emergency landing on nearby Mud Lake. McKay was badly injured, but alive. It took four hours to get him out of the cockpit, but he would recover to fly the X-15 again. There were now several new test pilots on the program. Before any of them took their place in the cockpit of an X-15, they went through rigorous preparation. The simulator was now much more sophisticated than the one Scott Crossfield had used. And for new pilot Milt Thompson, it was a satisfying and accurate representation of what to expect from the real thing. But the simulator still gave no idea of the physical sensation. However thorough the preparation, the prospect of a real flight in an X-15 was daunting. you knew you were going to be on the ground within eight to ten minutes one way or the other you were either going to have made a successful landing or come down on a parachute or made a smoking hole one or the other mill thompson made his first flight in october 1963 in spite of simulator training the performance surprised him you just try to keep up you know it's happening so fast uh, the whole flight depends on how well you perform in the first 82 seconds because that's how long the engine burns. And so the success of the mission is established right there and you're just trying like hell to keep up. For new pilot Joe Engel, there were some unexpected flight characteristics. As the airplane would heat up and as you got to that point where dynamic pressure was getting very high and the airplane was getting very, very sensitive and you could tell it, it was just, just like milk in a nervous mouse. You just didn't want to make any motions that you really didn't have to at all. Um, this nearly quarter inch steel on the side would oil can, just like a can does when you set it out on your driveway in the sun and it would go, go wham. And, and uh, I know Bob Brushworth, uh, 
told me and and warned me about it, uh, you know, ahead of the flight, uh, that he knew that I was going to go into that flight regime, that, that speed envelope. And uh, even knowing it was going to happen, every time that it happened, it was uh, a real, um, it really gets your attention. The thing that he tried to do was to keep the aircraft attitude fairly constant other than what you needed to change to accomplish uh, the mission for that flight. You didn't want to get the airplane moving in any axis other than the one that you were primarily concerned with because uh, once you got some rate started, uh, the rate would continue until you stopped it again. In other words, as you go over the top, uh, you may have a minus five degree pitch attitude, a left five degrees, and a right five degree roll, uh, whatever the attitude requirements are, and you must maintain those while the experiment does its thing. Then after the experiment is over, then you go back to uh, normal and coordinated flight and set up for a re-entry and uh, make the re-entry and a glide back to Edwards in a normal landing. Coming up on 20,000 now. Okay, I know you've done it, but check your flaps and circuit breakers. Right here. Uh, Ready to go pressurize? Pressurize. You're in good shape. Not every flight was a record flight, and obviously there was an awful lot of just very good, solid engineering and aerodynamic and aerothermodynamic data that was retrieved from the X-15 program. And I recognized that and tried as hard as I could to fly as accurate a profile as I was given, so that the data that I brought back was as applicable to what was desired and, and could be compared with the uh, theoretical data that they wanted to look at as possible. And, and it was so satisfying to slide out on the lake bed after a flight, uh, particularly one that not anything had gone wrong and you really knew that all the data that you brought back was exactly what the engineers were looking to get from that particular flight. In February 1964, the rebuilt number 2 X-15 was delivered. It was now called the A-2 and was potentially the fastest X-15 of all. What we were initially doing was expanding the envelope of the basic X-15 out to Mach 8. Now, the airplane was capable of going there. The only thing that limited us was the fact that we were out of fuel. And so we added fuel we added two external tanks to the airplane. Now that meant that we could probably get to those Mach numbers, or at least approach those Mach numbers, but that meant also that we were gonna be at those high speeds for a lot longer period of time. That meant that the temperatures on that airplane were gonna exceed the design limits of the airplane, so we had to cover the airplane with an ablative material. That coating was designed to burn away at high speeds and keep temperatures down. It was a pink material. And uh, I think I said that I'm not going to fly a pink airplane. But that really wasn't the reason. The, the reason was that that material, again, was kind of like a pencil of er eraser. And, it, and if it got into the systems in the airplane, it could cause problems. So to give it a little bit more of a structural integrity, we painted it with a white paint so that we could calm it down a little bit and allow the technicians to work on the airplane during pre-flight and post-flight. There was another peculiarity that was associated with that material, that as you got to the high speed portion of the flight, that material ablated, charred, emitted gases, whatever it did, but whatever it did, that material came back and stuck on the windows, and it made the windows opaque. So that meant that as we went out to the high Mach numbers, then I wouldn't have any visibility when I came back to land, so we corrected that, we put a an eyelid on the left window and so for launch I had the right window to look out of if I needed any uh, outside visibility I would proceed to the high Mach numbers and that window then would become opaque and as I slowed down below Mach 2 or 3 I could open the left eyelid and it would be a clear window and I would hope that the lake bed would be on the left side and make a left pattern and land just before the X-15A2 rolled out the follow-on program, the X-20, 
was canceled in favor of the development of manned rockets and the manned orbiting laboratory. The X-15 was now alone as a development vehicle capable of flying 